Okay, so actually our work started um, with, a, with a very basic question, namely how can a user securely store and of course also retrieve this private personal data if we don't want to assume that he has trusted user storage. So we don't want to make the assumption that he has a particular hardware device that is always available and always secure. And then probably a straightforward solution is to say, okay, let's simply encrypt the data and put it to the cloud. Then we have the nice availability from the cloud and the security from the, inscript, uh, from the encryption scheme. But what we, so that's certainly a good start, but what we have actually only done is to reduce the problem of how to secure our entire personal data to how to secure the decryption key. Because the disadvantage of such a key is that user can't memorize it. So it still has to, like, to put the key on some hardware device and we have to assume that the hardware device is available and trusted. And that was exactly the assumption that we tried to avoid. Um, but the good thing is now we only have to securely store some, some fixed uh, secret, and then we can actually apply a nice tool called uh, secret sharing. So all we can then do is to kind of secret share the decryption key over, uh, over end service. As you know, sec uh, secret sharing works like you provide end shares in the way that if you later on at retrieve at least t plus one of those shares, you can see securely reconstruct the key K. And thereby t plus one is really the lower bound. So if an adversary has at most t shares, he can actually not learn anything about the, the shared key K. So that looks like a good solution on how to store the key K because we don't have to rely anymore that we have a particular hardware device that we can trust. But we actually are not fully done yet because what is quite crucial for our um, problem we wanted to solve is that only the right user here can retrieve the keys because if everyone goes to the service and retrieve my secret key, I wouldn't be happy with the solution. So what we still have to solve is kind of how can we actually ensure that only the right user gets those shares. And of course, we can assume that the user has some sort of an authentication key, but then we basically go problem, uh, back to the problem we wanted to solve, namely how can we actually store that particular key we want to use to authenticate to those servers. So what we really want to have is that we kind of bootstrap the entire service. We want to make the user authenticate to the service in a way that the only thing he needs is something that he can memorize. And uh, then we don't have a lot of options, but basically we have to rely on, on passwords, on human memorizable passwords. And that is basically what um, the password authenticated secret sharing is about. So here you don't um, only share a secret key K with end service, but you also protect it somehow with the password P. So you also send some password shares to those servers. And this is done in a way that if you later on want to retrieve the key K, you also have to provide a password P prime. And the servers then verify whether the password P prime actually matches the password P that the user has used in the setup. And only if that is the case, the user can end up with uh, reconstructing the strong secret key. Um, so that looks like a kind of very useful primitive, um, but maybe some of you might kind of wonder whether relying or basing security on passwords is nowadays really um, a good idea because we have um, seen so many security incidents lately where we have the feeling like every week or, or months um, some, some major security incident happens where some service provider gets hacked and loses millions of user passwords. But the good news is actually that passwords aren't that bad. They're just often used in a bad way. Because what happens is that usually passwords are stored in a, in a hashed form, which allows the single party, the server, to verify whether the password P prime matches P. And the problem is if you have a single piece of information that allows you to verify whether a password is correct or not, then as soon as you lose the information or it's stolen by an adversary, then also the adversary can use it to make guesses of the password and verify whether it's correct or not. And given the low entropy that passwords usually have and the efficiency of those computations, you can actually make hundreds of million guesses if a password is correct or not, and then for the average password, it means it's broken in a really short time. But if you can avoid having such a single piece of information and basically shared of several servers, then passwords provide really good security. And the good thing is we're already in a multi-server setting and we're having something like secret sharing. So what password authenticated secret sharing does is it basically also adopts the idea of secret sharing to the password. So you don't, not only need T plus one shares to reconstruct K, but also to verify whether P prime equals P. And that means if you have at most T servers which are corrupt, then they not only learn anything about K, but they also can't offline attack P. Because if at most T servers are corrupt and you need T plus one to verify, you have a, always at least one honest server in the verification. And what an honest server will do is if it has seen that someone tries to log into your account 10 or 100 times and say, okay, something's going on here, something is fishy, I'll just block the account or I provide a capture or I send you an unblock code via, uh, via mobile phone. So basically the honest server in the verification set will 
mimic the behavior we know from bank cards, which will also block if we type in our pins three times in the wrong way. So there we have an even weaker secret, but it somehow works because we have some trusted authority, and that's kind of the honest server in here, that, that will block such a guessing attempt if it thinks something bad is happening. Okay, so that looks for our application that we want to solve, like the, the perfect tool to start with. And the good news is also that there are already solutions for that out there. So um, this concept and the protocol was proposed by Bagazan Yadal at uh, CCS 2011, who have a T out of N secret sharing scheme. And here later, a um, one out of two secret sharing scheme with um, proved efficiency and you see security was proposed by um, Kamede Jadal. But apparently we are not fully satisfied with those solutions yet. And the reason is that they actually not only require the user to store the password P prime or remember the password P prime, but also to securely remember some of the servers, or at least people's one of the servers he initially trusted it set up. And just to be sure, so uh, clear, so the, the the set here does not have to be secret as the password, but it has to be trusted. So the user is not allowed to make any typos or um, run into phishing attacks or actually ask someone to get reminded about whom trusts it um, initially. Because what happens if somehow the user is lured into trying to retrieve his password from T plus one bad service, and those are T plus one bad service he never initially trusted, so they were not in the setup phase because they're really, really bad, then they will actually learn the password to turn P prime. And that now is really bad because we said we want to base our entire security only on that password. So if we somehow get tricked into trying to run the protocol with bad service, they learn our only secret we still had, and of course can now go to the good service, get my secret, and also give me actually any other key K and convince me that this was my memory. So we thought this is actually um, kind of a bad attack or let's say a strong assumption that we still have some trusted user storage where we can um, trust that this set S prime BIM is not, is not um, altered with. And our work basically is about trying to avoid this assumption, trying to avoid uh, this type of attack. So in other words, we want uh, to build a threshold to a password authenticated secret sharing scheme where the user really only has to remember a username and password and doesn't have any need of personalized trusted user storage anymore. It also means that we don't have these um, attack I just showed on the last slide. And um, we formally define what we mean or what security guarantees uh, we aim for in, in terms of a ideal functionality in the UC framework. And here we went for, for the UC framework as we thought that for password-based protocols, it actually offers a very nice modeling or much more nicer uh, modeling than property-based definitions. Because what you have in UC is that the environment always provides um, the input to the honest parties um, and those are the password and the password attempt. So we don't make and you see any assumptions on how passwords are distributed or chosen from. Whereas in a property-based definition, you have somehow to define the distribution of passwords. I mean, probably it's not random, but you can define some dictionary, and then it's chosen at random from the distribution. Also meaning that if we have two different protocols, it's assumed that they are chosen at, at, in the, um, independently from those distributions, which is often not true, because I, for instance, or people often reuse passwords or parts of passwords for different services. So this is actually really hard to capture in a property-based def uh, definition, whereas in UC, it basically it's, it's abstracted away by the environment providing that as input. And what's also, also very nice with UC is that it um, provides very nice composition guarantees if you want to combine it with other protocols, which is, of course, of um, particular importance for our protocol as we want to reconstruct the strong key K that we wanted to reuse for other protocols, for instance, to decrypt the data that we have uploaded to the cloud. Okay, and I will, of course, not go through the details of the idea, func idea functionality, but just uh, present the, the security guarantees we were aiming for. So in our um, TPAS definition or scheme, of course, the user shares a secret key K, uh, secret K with N servers, um, protected by a password P such that if he was somewhat lucky and have chosen servers from which at most T are corrupt, then the adversary does not learn anything about the password or the key K. And for the retrieval, we then say that the user runs retrieval with now exact the T plus one service, so we make that a limitation to make the ideal functionality a bit more simpler. He provides a password P, P prime and then runs it with T plus one service. And uh, here it's important that the adversary will only learn whether P equals P prime if all the servers that the user has chosen really want to cooperate in the verification. So here again, the, the throttling comes in. An honest server will at some point not want to contribute anymore if it thinks that there's actually an, an attack going on on the account. And if the, advers uh, if the user is somehow unlucky and has come up with a set um, as prime bar, which contains only bad service, 
then the adversary, as I said before, does not learn the P prime anymore, but he only gets a single uh, password guess against P prime. So he basically can provide a P and he will learn the evaluation of that function. But again, it does not learn the password P prime. Um, and what is of course also important is that the adversary cannot set up the user with the wrong key, um, K star. Which comes with a disclaimer that it can happen if actually the user um, tries to retrieve the password from T plus one bad service. And those bad servers manage to, to guess directly the password P prime the user wants to authenticate with. But again, here now the, the guessing is only has a single guess against the password the user wants to use and cannot um, repeatedly try. So if my password is somewhat reasonable, hopefully the adversary cannot guess it in, in one or two attempts. Okay, so that's the, um, the security that we want, to, um, we want to achieve. And of course, we also have a protocol that, um, that realizes that. And the idea of our protocol is actually quite similar as the protocol idea of uh, Bakuzani et al. But we had to make a couple of twists to remove that need of trusted user storage. And also add quite some, um, some proofs through randomizations, et cetera, to make the protocol you see secure. Because the original protocol by Bakuzani et al. was proven secure with respect to a property-based definition. And the main building block we have is a tiered event threshold homomorphic encryption scheme. It has the following algorithms, had a, a key generation, that now outputs one public key and, and secret key shares. An encryption algorithm that is quite standard takes public key message and outputs a ciphertext and to um, decryption algorithm. A partial one that takes a secret key share, a ciphertext and outputs a decryption share and a threshold decryption algorithm that takes at least T plus one decryption shares and a ciphertext and outputs a message. So from that we will get our threshold property from and we also need some homomorphic um, property of that encryption scheme meaning that if we have two ciphertexts, C1 and C2 being encryptions of M1 and M2, we can apply some homomorphic operation on those ciphertexts that will translate down to an operation on the underlying plain text. Okay, then let's have a look at the, at the high level idea of our protocol. So what happens at setup when the user wants to share his secret, he first generates fresh keys of such an encryption scheme and then encrypts his password and his key K under the public key just generated. And then he distributes the information by sending his username, the two ciphertexts he just created, the public key, one secret key, uh, secret key share per server, and the set of servers he has chosen to each server. And if the, uh, the servers don't have an account for the UID, they simply store the information. And what we also assume here is that servers actually have certified public keys. Um, because we want, of course, to um, communicate those shares um, securely, but just to emphasize, if server have a public key, it doesn't mean they are trusted. It just means we can actually securely communicate with them, but also bad servers actually can have trusted public keys. Um, and what we then get um, from the setup phase is that if at most T servers here are corrupt, then we will have that by the semantic security of the threshold encryption scheme that the adversary doesn't learn anything about the password and key K because we have distributed them only in encrypted form. Um, and then for the retrieval, the user only remembers his username and password and somehow can now comes up with a set of T plus one servers. So he might go on the street and ask the first person who is the server that you trust, or he types it in in his favorite search engine. So he still has to somehow, of course, come up with a number or name of servers he wants to run the protocol with because he wants to run the protocol with them. But it's important that this information doesn't have to be trusted anymore. He can just try out something and hope it, it was the correct one. And what he then does, he asks those servers to remind him basically on his state from the setup. And he does so by sending his username and the set of servers he wants to run the retrieval with. And then each uh, server simply checks if they have an account for that username. And if so, if the set the, of servers the user now wants to run the protocol with is actually a valid subset um, of servers he specified in the setup. And also the check that the account isn't blocked. So here again, the throttling comes in. So an honest server at some point will simply refuse to cooperate if too many failed uh, login attempts already happened. But everything is fine, then the servers respond with the two ciphertexts and the public key. And the, the user then checks that, of course, he gets kind of consistent of the same information from all the servers and only continues if that is indeed the case. Uh, what happens next is he um, takes the ciphertext CP that the servers claim to contain an encryption of his password on the PK and computes a randomized password quotient. So he takes the password attempt he's now trying to, to log in P prime, computes one over and encrypts one over P prime with the public key he also received, applies a homomorphic operation on the result in CP and also adds some random exponent to it. 
And that ciphertext, Citasti, then sends to all the different servers. And the servers now um, apply the secret, share, secret key share they have and um, yeah, decrypt or partially decrypt that, uh, that ciphertext and send it back to the user. And the user now um, verifies whether the threshold decryption, so combining all the different decryption shares, actually yields the value one. Because what we have done here with that ciphertext is we have created an encryption of one if the password attempt P prime matches the password P that was claimed to be in the ciphertext CP, or we have created an encryption of a random value in case the password actually did not match. And the latter is quite important because it means that even if all the T plus one servers are corrupt and provided a wrong ciphertext CP star where they actually know the underlying P star from and PK star, they do not learn P prime from the ciphertext, they also only learn um, whether it matches P star or not by getting either also one or random value as output. Okay, and that is actually kind of the main trick of our construction that we have to, to get the security that our password attempt P prime is still secure if we try to authenticate with a really bad service. And the next step is because we still, of course, want to retrieve our strong secret K is that the user distributes all the decryption shares of that ciphertext C test to all the servers. The servers then verify also if the password actually matched and if that was the case, they compute the decryption share of uh, CK again, applying the secret key share and responded back uh, to the user. And finally, the user can, can reconstruct a strong key K by applying the th threshold decryption algorithm again. And of course, this is always only the high level idea of the protocol because what is of course quite important uh, in this step is that the decryption shares must be communicated securely to the user. So the user also generates a fresh encryption key at the beginning of the protocol and everything is then bound also to the public key. And also all the decryption, the partial decryption comes with a proof of correctness so that the user cannot be set up with a, um, with a wrong key. Okay, and that's um, basically the, the high level idea of the protocol. Again, the concrete uh, steps are of course a bit more complicated. And we proof then this protocol um, to securely realize our ideal functionality based on uh, or having a threshold homomorphic encryption scheme that is semantically secure. We also need two further encryption schemes. One needs to be CPA secure, another one CCA secure. One is for all the encryption to the sky. We need for the UC security, the CCA tool. Uh, one is needed to co securely communicate the decryption or uh, secret key shares. We need a signature scheme that is ex existentially unforgeable to um, let the server always assign their messages and the user can be sure that information is correct. A simulation sounds your knowledge proof system because whenever we actually re-randomize something or encrypt something, it has to come with a proof of correctness. And we also make the proof in a hybrid model where we assume um, that we have a CRS and a, and a CA. But again, having our service having public keys doesn't mean that they're per definition trusted. So to sum up, we have uh, proposed a threshold tier of N password authenticated secret sharing scheme where the user now can really store and reconstruct a strong secret K based only on a username and password and we don't have to rely on um, on any trusted user storage anymore because even if he runs into bad servers, they will not learn his password attempt P prime. And everything is proven secure in the UC framework, so it actually it comes with nice uh, composability guarantees. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>